right, guys. Welcome to another episode of the John the Baptist podcast. I hope everyone is having a great week so far. And before I get into anything, please remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, share this video with your friends, and preferably with your new IFB friends if you have any of those, uh, to educate them. And I don't mean that in a condescending way. I mean, really, maybe it could help them. But anyway, we're going to be continuing with our review of Jonathan Shelley's heretical sermon on the Trinity. And I hate to call it the Trinity because he's not, what he's teaching is not the Trinity. <laughs> it's more of like a Greco-Roman Trinity. Uh, it's like a Greco-Roman pagan conception of God. But anyway, I played back my last episode to myself and I got to say, I'm a bit disappointed in the G-Dog. I concede that last episode was a bit boring. And that's because I had to get back to the basics of God's omnipresence and his infinitude, just these basic attributes of God that in some sense could be boring to go over because everybody just really understands this already intuitively. But if you just read the Bible, you understand these things quite clearly. But you're kind of forced to get back to basics when you have Shelley up there talking about God's three faces and uh, three sets of pectoral muscles and six biceps. When his conception of God is this, you kind of got to get back to basics. You kind of got to talk about the attributes of God, his infinitude, his omnipresence, so on and so forth. Uh, my hands were tied, guys. I'm sorry. But today's going to be a little bit different. Um, this sermon, I had slowed it down, or sorry, sped it up so that the full length of the sermon is about 38 minutes. And we're about 10 minutes through the sermon. So the, to the total sermon is 38 minutes, and I we're about 10 minutes through. We're gonna, I'm going to try to let it play, let him talk more, and just kind of give drive-by comments today <laughs> to speed this process along. Otherwise, there's going to be like 10 episodes on this. I want to finish it within the next two or three episodes. So, go ahead. Talk, Shelly. I also believe it's a little bit disingenuous to say, well, we're going to finally see Jesus' face in Revelation 22, verse 4. When, let's think about this. In the Old Testament, many people actually saw a pre-incarnate Christ, didn't they? I mean, we have Melchizedek. We have... Abraham saw Melchizedek. Jacob wrestled with a guy. We have uh, Manoah saw what he said, God face to face, okay? And his life was preserved. Um, we have, then we have kind of this distinction where Moses doesn't... Okay, so this argument is inconsequential to classical Trinitarianism because it's predicated on the straw man that classical Trinitarianism asserts that the face that we will see in the eternal state, the face that's referenced in Revelation 22 that classical Trinitarianism says it's the incarnate Christ. But as I noted in the last episode, I affirm that the face that we will see is a reference to the divine nature, to the Trinity itself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the divine nature. However, the language of seeing his face is not literal as in seeing with our eyeballs a humanoid body with a face and orbital bones and eye sockets and a nose. That's not what it's talking about. The beatific vision refers to our direct apprehension or experience of God as he is in his omnipresent, infinite glory. And this is obviously not done with eyeballs because God is invisible. Uh, and I, as a matter of fact, most classical Trinitarians would affirm that the face is a metaphor for the divine nature. So they would say it's not referring to the face of the incarnate Christ. It's referring to the face of the divine nature. Um, the only exception to this, I believe, is the Puritan John Owen. I think he did think... Uh, he did interpret the face in Revelation 22 as being the face of the incarnate Christ and us seeing uh, kind of like the transfiguration for eternity or something like that. But even, even John Owen, I'm confident that the genius John Owen uh, would not be stumped by the midwit of Shelley. I'm pretty sure he could come up with a good explanation um, <laughs> to Shelley's supposed conundrum here. And get to see someone's face and this person's constantly clouded and covered and when he saw his backside his face literally shone so bright then we have kind of this distinction where moses doesn't get to see someone's face and this person's constantly clouded and covered and he only gets to ever see his backside and when he saw his backside his face literally shone so bright they had to cover moses's face now here's the thing every person that saw melchizedek the person that wrestled the person right what did moses see again shelly was it was it this was this what Moses saw? Or was it more of like a, um, was it more like a Jay Cutler type back? 
Or are we talking more of a, a classical Arnold pumping iron look? What exactly did, did Moses see? This is, what Moses, this is what Moses saw, according to Jonathan Shelley. The back and the traps and the rear delts. All right, all right. Enough joking. Joshua sitting and, and talking to the guy, none of their faces shown. Not a single time. All the disciples that literally saw Jesus, Mary, the mother of Jesus, none of their faces shown. Peter, James, and John saw Jesus Christ transfigured before their eyes, their faces never shown, okay? So it seems like there's a difference between this person that Moses encountered and the person that everybody else encountered, right? Okay, so once again, this is not a problem or a refutation of classical Trinitarianism. I affirm that Moses' experience was different from seeing the incarnate Christ or even the, the Christophanies of the Old Testament, which were visible temporary manifestations of Jesus Christ. Uh, Moses, however, did not see the traps and the lats and the rear delts of God the Father. Right? Uh, once again, this is not what Moses was looking at, right? That's clearly anthropomorphic language. Uh, he either saw some visible manifestation of God's glory that was greater than the pillar of fire, or, in my estimation, uh, he didn't see anything with his eyeballs at all, necessarily. Uh, in Hebrews, it says, Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. And that, to me, seems to, seems to, uh, to suggest that Moses didn't actually have a visual experience as others did in the Old Testament when they saw the Christophanies. Um, to me, when it says, saw him who is invisible, that means that he experienced or apprehended the invisible God to a greater degree than any man has been able to on earth. And none of this, of course, necessitates a body for God the Father. In fact, that would contradict scores of scriptures on the invisible, omnipresent, infinite nature of God. So, none of this is a problem for the classical Trinitarian position. I affirm Moses' experience was different from the others, but that does not necessitate a literal body. Plus, if we, when we go to heaven, I do believe we'll see Jesus without a question. I think everybody that's a Christian believes that, okay? So we're all going to see him. Yeah, everybody that's a Christian also believes that Jesus did not always have a physical body. <laughs> and then we're going to come down and we're going to be on earth for a thousand years, ruling and reigning with Christ and hang out with and seeing him. Then what's the significance of then just seeing him now after all of that in Revelation 22, 4? Like, it seems like we've already kind of been hanging out and seeing him for so long. But you know how we, we haven't been hanging out and seeing, according to the scriptures, the Father. Okay, so then it almost seems like, hey, now there's a unique event in Revelation 22, 4, where we have the new heaven, the new earth, we've already gone through the great white throne judgment, now we finally get to see God the Father's face. And okay, so I agree that the beatific vision is reserved for the eternal state. Uh, that the, in other words, the saints in heaven right now cannot see the face of God the way that we are said to be able to see God's face in Revelation 22. Um, they can see the glorified human nature of the Son, I suppose, uh, but they don't have a full apprehension of the divine nature that we will have in the eternal state but of course that even that that's not going to be a literal face with orbital bones and, and so on and so forth uh, but here's my question to shelly does this spirit body of god the father does it have a spirit liver does it have spirit muscle fibers does it have spirit strands of hair or is it just a facade is it just a veneer like th th he has the the spirit face but what makes the face the, the shape of the face in humans is are the bones right does he have the bones does he have the orbital bones does he have a rib the, a spirit rib cage under the under the spirit robes and <laughs> and the spirit torso or is he just a larping is he just a larping as a human and it's just hollow in there it's spiritually hollow Look, think about how ridiculous this is Every other time we see some kind of glimpse or vision, they never see the face, do they? Stephen looks up and he sees Jesus and Jesus is standing. He's not on the throne, but there's, there's Jesus at the right hand of it, isn't he? Okay. And it seems... Okay. We covered Stephen's experience in episode 22 because Anderson also used this argumentation. Now, first of all, nothing in the text in Acts chapter 7 referring to what, what Stephen saw says that he saw... Not Jay Cutler again. He did, oh, yeah. Well, he also didn't see this, okay? <laughs> but uh, nothing in the text says that he saw two bodies, okay? It says over here, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. So he saw the glorified body of Jesus Christ at the right hand 
of the glory of God uh, at the right hand being a metaphor for Jesus' glorified, exalted uh, state post-ascension. And the glory of God, here it says that he saw the glory of God. The glory of God is always described as either fire or smoke or a cloud or some supernatural use of the elements. That's the way it's used throughout Scripture. Here's just one such example. In Exodus 16.10, it says, And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Okay, so he, in this instance, the glory of the Lord is a cloud. In other instances, we see in the temple that the temple is filled with smoke, and the smoke would be also the glory of the Lord. Um, I'm not going to turn, I'm not going to go to to those passages right now. But what Stephen likely saw was the glorified Christ, the glorified body, human nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, emerging out of a glorious cloud or smoke, signifying his deity. Uh, he did not see two bodies. He did not see again. Arnold and his classical pose. He saw one body, but obviously not like this. <laughs> obviously, if the, the, the glorified Jesus Christ is still a human body, but obviously he's not a clown like Arnold Schwarzenegger here. Even though I like Arnold. And it seems like Jesus is always the one interacting, right? He's coming off and on the throne, doing different stuff, getting on the horse, taking the books out of the hand of him, but doing all these different activities. But there's just Did you catch that little Andersonism? That <laughs> those little Anderson movements? Again, the eternal LARPing of Jonathan Shelley, LARPing as Steven Anderson. It's a role. He's playing a role. He's an actor. He's playing the role of Steven Anderson. He's playing the role of a pastor. Goodness, to use the word pastor of this man is, makes me uh, cringe with horror. Why don't we just say F Joe Biden? But clearly this man is a, an eternal LARPer. And Anderson is the character he's LARPing as. There's one always seating on the throne. That kind of makes sense that God the Father is just always on his throne. He's always just sitting on his throne. He doesn't have to get off of his throne. Everything's happening. But without having the Father on the throne, you kind of don't have anybody on the throne when Jesus is doing all these different interactions, do you? Okay. Imagine thinking God has to be on the throne. But, but, but did you catch that? The new IFB still does not grasp the classical Trinitarian position or the classical understanding of God. Okay. Shelley is suggesting that classical Trinitarians assert that the three persons share the one incarnate body of Christ. And Anderson alluded to the same thing in his sermon. But follow this midwit reasoning, okay? They think if the incarnate body is engaging in activities, then the throne is empty because the Father is also the incarnate body. Or something like that. What? No one on the planet Earth believes that. The classical Trinitarian position is that God has no body. He is an immaterial substance. He's an immaterial being. He has no body outside of the human incarnation of the Son. There's the human nature that is uniquely God the Son's human nature. And then there's the divine nature that is infinite and omnipresent and eternally exists as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the incarnate Son can engage in activity with his incarnate body and God can be on his throne as in reigning over all of the universe. Right? He's not literally bound to existing as a body sitting down on a throne. That's a problem a lot of times. These guys don't even understand the position. Not that they would agree with it anyway, uh, but in many cases, they're straw manning. Now, it seems, again, also disingenuous that if there's only ever one view that we can ever have of God, and that's only Jesus Christ, th then why at his baptism do we seem to have three different persons, right? With three different bodies. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. Yeah. You don't have three different bodies, okay? You, you don't have three bodies at the baptism. He's just making things up here. You do have three distinct persons. And once again, he's conflating persons with bodies here. You have three distinct persons, but not three bodies. The best you can do if you want to have a childish understanding of Scripture is two bodies. The incarnate Christ and the spirit in the form of a dove. But of course, the incarnation is not the divine nature. That's not how God eternally exists. Neither does he eternally exist as a dove. That's clearly a temporary manifestation of God, the Holy Spirit. Right? I don't have a, a little dove dwelling inside me right now. Okay. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water and lo, the heavens were open unto him and he saw the spirit of God. Did you notice that it says that he literally saw the spirit of God? But then people say you can't see it. Okay, this is a metaphor, right? He saw the spirit of God. Oh no. This poor soul 
is under the impression that he just pulled off like a 360 windmill dunk mid game or something. Did you see his face? He thought this was that was a great point. Wow, I'm I'm literally embarrassed for him right now. Obviously, the dub the dove was visible because it was a temporary manifestation of the Holy Spirit. That's not how the Holy Spirit truly exists. He thinks that because we saw the dove, therefore you can actually see God's nature or his essence. So my question to Shelley is, how does he even understand the scriptural fact that God is invisible, right? The Bible says this several times because in his view, there's, he's not invisible in any sense. You could just see everything. You could see God, the father's body. You could see the Holy spirit as he truly exists and all these things. In what sense is God invisible to Jonathan Shelley? Descending like a dove and lighting upon him and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I don't know how you couldn't get from the idea that there's someone in the water, Jesus, there's the spirit of God descending. And then there was also a voice. It sounds like there's three persons with three bodies that are interacting and they're all in unison and unity together. There are three persons represented here, but there are not three bodies. At best, once again, you got two. And one of them is the incarnation that occurred in time, not in eternity. Now, that, that Shelley does not grant that because he thinks that, that the incarnate son, that the son has always had a body of flesh, a physical body from all eternity. So that, that, that's one of the bodies that's there. The other is clearly a theophany of the Holy Spirit, right? It's not his eternal dove body. But, but it, again, it just seems disingenuous that you have all these pictures of... It's not disingenuous if your IQ is higher than 75. <laughs> literal body, they'll say, well, that was a dove. Right, you understand that God is uh, making points and not speaking literally all the time. Okay, let's just, let's just say for your argument's sake, it was a literal bird that they saw. That's what they saw as they saw the bird. Well, then again, why is God giving us multiple bodies, but he himself can't be multiple bodies, right? Like Because God can manifest himself to man however he pleases in the economy of creation however god's nature is infinite and does not eternally exist in a finite body the infinite being of god cannot cannot be circumscribed to a finite body and this is the other thing the new ifb is constantly conflating economic categories with ontological categories economic referring to how god deals with man how God deals in the creation and salvation and in history. And ontological refers to God as he is from all eternity, as he is before the creation, before the incarnation, before all these things. They're constantly looking at texts or passages that are referring to the economic trinity or the trinity in the economy. And they're trying to um, throw that back onto the ontological trinity. And of course, th that ought not be done. Why is, and then if it was a dove, well, how do I know that when I see a dove, it's not the Holy Spirit? Or how do I know? And like, if God's just shape-shifting into anything and everything, then what stops him from shape-shifting into the camera? How do I know he's not the oh camera right goodness. now? How do I not know he's just one of you sitting here right now? Like, then it starts, then it's Okay, so we're uh, devolving into Reddit atheist tier argumentation here. This is like reading Reddit, like these Reddit atheist arguments. I, I don't even know what to say. This is not even <laughs> worthy of a response. What, why, can, why can't God be the camera? It starts to lose its, its power of like who even God even is. Because God's just the random homeless guy sitting on the corner now. Lose its power to who God even is. Meanwhile, this guy thinks that God has three literal bodies. Or God's just a rock, or God's just a tree, or God's just a bird, or God's just whatever object. Like now it starts losing value of who God is. Whereas according to the Bible, it's like if God showed up, we'd all just die. We'd all just fall on our face and die, and it would just be like a, a, an incredible event. What? So I, I don't think that he just... He just defeated his own argument because no one fell down and died at the sight of the Holy Spirit as a dove. I'm not even sure what point he was making there. Just showing up as random objects or birds or whatever, I think that he literally saw the Spirit of God, and that was a special vision, and then you couldn't really see God the Father. You could hear his voice, though, right? So my question is Good. this. Jesus, the Spirit of God, and the voice portrayed as three distinct locations, uh, but they're not? Like, how, are they three, were they in three different locations or not? Okay, that's my basic my question. Oh my goodness. Three different locations? 
This man has no understanding of God whatsoever. God does not exist in location, in any location. He is in every location. God is infinite. He's omnipresent. Now, for our understanding, for our human understanding, for our benefit, God manifests himself locally at times. But this is not how the divine nature exists. Right? Uh, to put it the way that Robert Sargent, the independent Baptist King James only theologian, whose systematic theology I, I've referenced a few times here, he puts it this way. God's center is everywhere, but his circumference is nowhere. That's a great way to put it. God's center is everywhere. He's not, he doesn't have one center where you could say God is here. His center is everywhere. He is equally present everywhere. As a matter of fact, his nature is omnipresent. That's how he exists. We can't understand it, but that is how God exists. His circumference is nowhere. You can't get a measuring tape and then measure God's waist. <laughs> the way Jonathan Shelley seems to suggest. But in the new IFP's position, you can actually measure the circumference of God. Three times over, actually. There, he has three different waists, I guess. Um, let's go to Daniel 7. I have one more question before I kind of get into the, the wills here for a moment. But if Jesus Christ can only be seen because of the incarnation, okay, which the word incarnation is kind of a fancy word, what that just means is the moment when he became flesh, right? When he was in Mary's womb, he was conceived and he became a, a I guess in new IFB circles, the incarnation is a fancy word. That, that about sums up everything for you there. Incarnation is a fancy word here for these people. Man, that's what the incarnation is referring to. So before this, when we talk about Melchizedek, when we talk about Jacob wrestling with people. And I don't want to be condescending toward the people in the pews. I, I never want to do that. But, but I, I mean, come on, incarnation, that's a fancy word. <laughs> Okay, here's my question. Whose body did the pre-incarnate Christ use? Again, was it just a random, like he just a loner? Like he just shapeshifted into Cameron and just, you know, was out there, he's Melchizedek now or whatever? Or he shapeshifted into another guy that is sitting on a horse or just, he's just, again, this is just this random person, just a random body that we've never seen before and he just shapeshifted in. Oh my goodness. No one on the planet Earth believes that he was using a loner body in the Old Testament Christophanies. It, 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 he was you see this is just a complete straw man a misunderstanding okay he was likely referring to christ christ was likely appearing temporarily in the same body that he would eventually become permanently incarnate in but it was only temporarily appearing in that body right this is not difficult it, the depths of stupidity that you have to descend to in order to think that this is a conundrum for classical trinitarianism is, is unfathomable. I don't even know what, what his point is here. Well, to me, that almost undermines the entire premise of the incarnation, right? Like, what's special about him being in that body as opposed to the random loner Melchizedek body or the random loner wrestling body or the random body that he used all the other times that we apparently had him in the Old Testament? How about the random body he has in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, okay? Well, it starts losing its significance unless it's just him. Like, that was just him every single time in an immortal state which makes sense since he wasn't catching on fire. And then what made it special is that he took on mortal flesh. He took on our nature where he could actually suffer and hurt and be killed and die and blood could be shed. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. This man is truly blind to the irony that is like, that is like left hooking him right in the jaw. Okay, so first he sets up the straw man of loner bodies for Christ in the Old Testament and accuses that position that he created, which nobody in the history of the planet holds, he accuses that position of stripping away the significance of the incarnation. Meanwhile, this guy is saying that Jesus always had a body from eternity. Talk about taking away the significance of the incarnation. In his Mormon view, Jesus has eternally been incarnate. And the only thing that changed in his birth from Mary was the state of the physical body he already had from eternity. He says the only thing that changed elsewhere, he doesn't specify it here, but elsewhere he says the only thing that changed, he always had a body, and the only thing that changed is it went from immortal to mortal. So let's play this clip. We've played it a million times, but this is the official 
Jonathan Shelley doctrine on the incarnation here or on Christ, the person of Christ in general. Jesus Christ is always the son of man. He's always been the son of man. He's always been the son of God. Those things, he's, he's, he's I'm the Lord I change. He's not. Okay, he was those things from eternity past. He's those things in eternity future. So he's always been that. You know how we got a body? Because we were made in his likeness. We were made in his image. He had a body, he had a soul, and he had a spirit. And you know what he made? He made a man with a body, a soul, and a spirit. So there, he's teaching that Jesus Christ has always been the son of man. He's always had a body. He's always had a body, soul, and spirit. And that's why we have a body, soul, and spirit. That, that in his view, is what it means to be made in the image of God. But the irony in saying that, in making up a position that nobody believes of loner bodies for christ in the old testament and saying that takes away from the incarnation meanwhile this guy believes that the incarnation was literally nothing it's just christ doing what he always had already been doing which is existing in a body let's continue but i don't know whose body did the pre-incarnate christ use just ask some questions here's the last one i want to ask kind of related to another verse here daniel chapter number seven and, of course, Daniel, again, is, is a book of prophecy and some visions and everything like that. But look Of course, the book of Daniel is a book of prophecies and some visions, and not to be taking hyper-literally, but I'm going to do that anyway. Daniel chapter 7 and verse number 13. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So here would be my question. Who is the Son of Man and who is the Ancient of Days? Who is the Son of Man that came to the Ancient of Days? And who's the Ancient of Days that received the Son of Man? And who's the Ancient of Days that gave, you know, power and dominion unto the Son of Man? Well, you know, you can't see the Father. You can't see the... It, it just starts falling apart pretty quickly, doesn't it? Okay. No. The Ancient of Days is God the Father, or you could even say it's God generally, right? Like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is represented by the ancient of days and the son of man is the incarnate christ right the son's human nature that's obvious and this is a vision as shelley himself uh, stated just before he mentioned this passage god does not literally have white hair and a robe as described in daniel's vision if you get into that also where's the holy spirit again he can't find one passage with three bodies because the majority or, or, or most of these don't even mention the Holy Spirit because the majority of these texts are dealing with the distinctions between the human nature and the divine essence generically. They're not referring to the eternal intrapersonal distinctions within the Trinity. Obviously, what is this picture of? Well, it sounds like... It, because you would expect in each one of these examples, if it's really trying to tell us that there's a, a body for each of the members of the Trinity some sort of a spirit body, how come the Holy Spirit is missing in almost all of the proof texts he used? And in none of them, in, in zero instances, is there can there be anything conceived of as three bodies, and certainly not three eternal bodies. Like when Jesus Christ came and had offered himself and was presenting himself to the Father with our blood, and that was that blood atonement that's referenced in the book of Hebrews, and how he went in the presence of God one time, with the sacrifice of himself, and that's what gives us our full atonement. But, you know, they kind of ruin the idea that God the Father can have a uh, presence or be in a specific location or have this body. They kind of ruined the idea that God the Father can have a body. <laughs> okay, so I agree. This is a picture of Christ presenting the atonement to God. But notice how Shelley's view of God is so limited and finite. It, to a comical extent, even. He thinks God the Father must exist in a local finite fashion in order to receive the sacrifice i assure you god the father can receive the sacrifice of the atonement just fine without a literal body it's just these these creaturely ways of thinking of god god he god the father has to be here the, the son has to be here okay i don't want that's kind of blasphemous but i'm just using it god the father has to be here the son has to be here and he has to be able to approach him literally physically and give him a blood atonement. A God is not like us. This Christ can present the atonement to him without God the Father having a body. So those are just a few questions I wanted to bring up. So if, and I think this is the thing, if you really could go to heaven and you really see the Father sitting next to the Son, then it starts to make everything else a little bit easier to understand.
Yes, I agree. Pago, uh, Pago, <laughs> pagan Greco Roman religion and Mormonism is easier to understand than the infinite essence of the triune Christian God. I agree with you there, Shelley. And I believe that not only do they have their distinctions in the sense that you could see them both, but they have distinct wills that are referenced in Scripture. Well, of course, once you accept three Mormon bodies, you have no problem accepting three different wills. Right? The three bodies is, is the more overt and obvious heresy of anything. Three wills is also heresy proper. Okay, just in the proper historical sense, that is heresy. Everyone has always recognized it as such. But it's probably not as bad as saying God has three bodies. Now, go if you would to, um, let's go to Luke 12 first. Okay, I want to show you one more thing before we kind of get into this. Now, when I talk about distinction and will, first of all, the Bible just plainly states this. There's, there's no way to get around the fact there's a distinction in will between the Father and the Son. But what some people will say is that the only distinction is because Jesus had a body and, you know, the, so that human nature had kind of a, a separate will from his divine will. And they kind of make this incarnation will, as it were. But I, I want to submit. They, they kind of make this incarnation will. Yeah, that insignificant event known as the incarnation, where God the Son took on a completely human nature. He took part of the same. As the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he likewise took part of the same, took part of the same humanity we have, human flesh, human blood, a human soul, a human mind, a human will, etc., in order to redeem all of those human components so that we can be totally redeemed. Right, the incarnation where God, the eternal son, took on this fully human nature. That incarnation, my goodness, the new IFB has such a low and even blasphemous disregard for the son's incarnation. It's you that I believe it goes beyond that to where Jesus Christ had a separate will from the father even before his incarnation. Okay, but I want to show you another example. Think about just how... I mean, you just know intuitively that that's wrong. The Son had a separate will in heaven prior to the incarnation, had a separate will from the Father. ...where we have a distinction in the persons. Look at Luke 12, verse number 10. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. If we don't really have a distinction in persons in the Trinity, how does this verse even make sense? If the Son of Man or Jesus Christ is the Holy Ghost, then how could you say, well, you can blaspheme Jesus and it could technically be forgiven. But okay, so Shelley is now strawmanning with impunity. Uh, he is conflating modalism or oneness with classical Trinitarianism. Now, may I remind Shelley that classical Trinitarianism gave him the theological term persons that he is now redefining? Okay, classical Trinitarianism affirms, that the, affirms the eternal distinctions of persons between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No classical Trinitarian has ever said that the Holy Spirit is the Father or that the Son is the Father or that the Holy Spirit is the Son or anything like that. Now, the new IFB used to say that for a decade and then overcorrected and swung the pendulum to the opposite extreme of polytheism. Now, what he's saying right now is a good refutation of modalism, but it's inconsequential to the historical, biblical, orthodox view of the Trinity. But if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, it's not forgiven. But the really but I wonder if the people that, that, that listen to this even recognize this. They don't, because they are, in many cases, cult members. It doesn't matter if he's straw manning. It doesn't matter if he's misrepresenting a position. They don't care. They're like fans cheering at some sort of a sport event. But I mean, like, is this going to be the team you root for here? This guy? This is your mascot? I mean, Anderson is a much more charismatic figure. If I were people in this year, I'd just all, if you're going to be part of the new IFB, just move to Arizona, okay? Just move to Arizona. Why be with watered down, not as cool, not as funny, not as charismatic version of Anderson? Not saved. Right. Yep. Just the same person. Well, that sounds like there has to be a distinction in persons for that to even be possible, okay? So, and again, uh, I think that Jesus is just letting himself take a really humble state and he came in a way that was not necessarily in a lot of power and glory. So he allows for the, the forgiveness of sins for blasphemy. Whereas the power of the Holy Ghost, you know, witnessing miracles and stuff, they're not going to let you get off the hook when you're blaspheming that, right? Okay, so there's kind of an explanation why that's true. Go over to John chapter 6 now. Go to John chapter 6. Let's talk about the wills that the Bible brings up. And I could point to so many places where there's a distinction in the wills. 
But every time I do, they'll just wiggle out and say, well, that was just his flesh or something. Like the famous quote where he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, not my will, but thy will be done. Like if Okay, so recognizing the reality of the human incarnation of the Son and all that it entails is wiggling out. Right? But believing in the hypostatic union, as all Christians always have, is wiggling out. But this kindergarten approach to theology where you ignore all of God's attributes and just see separate bodies and separate minds everywhere, that's not wiggling out. He's got all this backwards. Now he's going to get into um, the text in John 6, but we're going to stop it here for now because uh, now he's going to transition into things that are a bit weightier and we might have to spend a little more time on. Um, so let's leave it there for now, guys. I hope this was helpful to you. I hope you had a good day, have a good week. God bless you. Take care.